We're filming today for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive. My name is Monk Rowe, and it's a great pleasure to have Dave Pell with us, saxophonist and huh. photographer. Oh, yes. Record producer, uh -huh. publisher, all those things. A lot of hats, a lot of interests, and uh, all coming from music. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's all surrounded in that creative world of yeah. our our dreams of being able to play in bands and being able to play and, and enjoy and it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of times in, in the music business you need to wear a lot of hats. I guess so. Uh, I always did. I kind of think the guys in the bands always resented it a little bit because I had so many hats on. You know, mm -hmm. I was, uh, yeah, I was playing with him, but he's also the contractor and he's also yes. making double while we're dubbing, uh, getting for being paid, and he's also running the record company, and he's also <laughs> yeah. uh, editing out our good solos and saving his good ones, you know, and so uh, I always had a reaction from the guys, but I was still one of the guys, enough to, to be able to get more out of them than the normal kind of record company or producer, you know. From a musician standpoint, you maybe have a better handle on what's really good than a non-musician. Taste is hard to taste. acquire. Yes. Uh, you get taste from from sitting next to great players and and listening. <clears throat> I remember uh, when I was real young. I mean, 16, uh, 16 years old. <clears throat> I played in a band called Bob Astor, and my roommate was Neil Hefty. And the drum on the band was Shelly Mann. And uh, I remember going, uh, playing in Boston. And we were the relief band, and then there was another relief band, and there was a show band. It was at the Boston club called, uh, oh, I don't even remember. But uh, Les Height was the other band, and Dizzy Gillespie was on the other band. And he and I were just kids together. And between shows, we'd play chess. And we had a great time playing chess. And then at night, he'd say, come on, kid. <laughs> and he would take me down to the Ken Club, where he and Charlie Parker were working at night. You know, we, we did this thing, and then late at night, we'd yeah. go to the Ken Club. And then he'd sit and, and play this stuff, and we, what was that? And then I'd try to ask Dizzy, it's like, how do you teach jazz? You can't teach jazz, it's impossible. But Dizzy try to explain what he was thinking when he played certain things. We're playing the key of C, you play an F, you, you know, you do that. And all the things that he was thinking as he did it, and then he, he'd give us a couple of things to think about and to play, and it was, it was incredible. And then, of course, he'd sneak us in the club, and we'd sit there all night long to four or five in the morning with he and Charlie Parker, right at the beginning. And, and that's wow. how you learn. That's where you learn. That's where you learn taste and learn what the guys are thinking, what they're playing, and that's where you get in good habits or you get in bad habits. You know, if you're really interested, you learn. If you're not interested, you have a great time. You know, talk about learning from the masters. Oh, it was fun. Yeah. But a lot of players that you play with, and uh, I was in Bobby Sherwood's band, and uh, I took Zoot Sims' place. He moved to first alto, and I played his tenor chair. Well, I'm sitting next to Zoot all night. I mean, what could be bad about that? And we're both kids, you know. This is in the 40s, and uh, I quit the band I was with in the 40s and, and stayed on the West Coast and got the job in the relief band. And Stan Getz, myself, yeah. you know, uh, great players wow. are sitting in a relief band, a Latin band. And we're having a great time. But you're learning from the guy. Like Stan was the greatest dressing room player that ever lived. He'd get out front and he'd choke. No kidding. Oh, he was terrible. He was so insecure and uh -huh. so such an introvert that he couldn't get up like me. And, oh, I don't give a damn. I'm going to get up and play. You know, it's, uh, it's another thing. For our students uh, that will watch this, can you explain Relief Band? Because Relief Band is uh, uh, the, the main attraction's got to go out and get uh, a 20 minute break, and they don't want not like now they play records or right. something like that there you had to have a live band on stage mm -hmm. and usually a different kind of band so that you could do the rumba like we had a latin band playing a four brothers type uh, mm -hmm. tenor book you know and then we play yeah. freddie martin style and then we played latin and we do this and then the other bands whoever the name band was at the palladium which was every four or five weeks uh we just sat there and 
said hello to the guys, and yeah. you know, it was great. It was, but I stayed in L.A. I didn't have to go on the road, mm -hmm. so I really enjoyed it. Now, and then you went with uh, Tony Pastor later on. No, I was with Tony Pastor getting there. I see. Uh, and the story about Tony Pastor, I get to California and I say, "Gee, Tony, this is great. Goodbye. I'm quitting." <laughs> He says, you can't be, leave me in L.A. This is the wilderness. There's no guys. I can't get a guy to leave California. They all want to come here. I said, goodbye. <laughs> and so he says, well, stay with me till we leave California, and then you can quit. So six weeks later, I left the band. But I had fun with Tony because uh, I'd rush. I'd run out to the microphone to beat him to his own solos because he didn't really like to play, but I, the only way I could get to play was to be a cocky <laughs> kid and run up to the mic all the time, and he's ready to play, and I'm up there playing already. So, sorry, Tony. It you know. sounds like you didn't lack for self-confidence. Oh, or no, I was a smart-ass. <laughs> terrible. I was just terrible. But that's, that's kind of the thing that you have to do. Uh, it's, it's almost like the, the side men on the band. They keep watching the leader and watching all the mistakes he makes. Uh-huh and all the wrong things he does, because in the back of his mind, I'm going to be a leader someday, and yeah. I ain't never going to yeah. put myself. I mean, Les Brown, I had a great time with Les's band, and played on every tune. You know, I had a great, great book to play, and we had Fagerquist and all the good players. And I remember, uh, as I went out every time to, to play a solo out front, we just didn't stand up, we'd go out front, showbiz. And uh, I remember kicking over Les's horn at least once a night. Oh, I tripped. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, Les, I'll, I'll fix it later. Well, uh, he didn't play too well. And we didn't like him playing in the band with us because the saxophone sounded so good. Yeah. But when he played, he played awful. And so if his horn didn't work, I don't know whether he wouldn't play. And, and Les, after years and years, he finally figured out I was doing it on purpose. You know, I'm so clumsy, Les, I'm sorry. But I was kicking over his on so he wouldn't play, you know. <laughs> terrible, <laughs> terrible. But I always want to be a leader, you know. Yeah. Uh, even in the worst way, uh, you want to be a leader. Somehow you want to be able yeah. to say, no, no, my tempo. And then right. the drummer in the back says, no, Dave, that's the wrong <laughs> tempo. You got to kick it up here, you know. <laughs> Well, when you became a leader, I assume you kept your horn out of the way anyway. Oh, yeah, I was cool. I was cool. I was handy. I could fix my horn. <laughs> when, when did the, uh, the first octet come about? Well, we were all from the Lessons Band. I stayed in California in the 40s. I stayed, uh, played around. I played uh, the relief band at the Aragon Ballroom for Lawrence Welk. We were in the, the secondary band mm -hmm. again. I played with uh, Tommy Dorsey out there. I played with uh, Bob Crosby out there. I played with uh, all trying to stay home, get off the road. You know, I took uh, Eddie Miller's place on Bob Crosby's band because Eddie couldn't read, and they were doing a radio show at the time. Oh. And he didn't have his doubles, and I was starting to play oboe and English horn and those things. Um, uh, the greatest part about that bringing up was that we still wanted to stay in L.A. You know, and Les's band was great because we'd do the Bob Hope show. And we'd work mm -hmm. Tuesday night on the radio show and then work Saturday, maybe Friday and Saturday, but all within the area. So we were still off all week long. We had a great income and uh, went on the road for the summer. We did one night as all summer. Yeah. And then, of course, television came about. We did one of those a month, and that was enough to live on. It was great. Oh. And I started my octet from the guys in the band. Uh, Les Brown had a, a, a sound of the whole brass section and a, a amplified guitar underneath it all, playing single string uh, underneath the brass section. So there was an, a little electronic sound mm -hmm. and then the regular saxes and everything else. And they would play maybe in mutes and the guitar would be underneath it and it was a very different sound. And Shorty Rogers and I talked about it. I said, why can't we, I want to take the soloist away from Les, of which he got pretty mad at me. Uh, I want to take the soloist out of the band. Fagerquist, Ray Sims on trombone, and Ronnie Lang, and the rhythm section. And I want a small band. You know, I, I, we have this idea. And Shorty came up with the idea mm -hmm. of putting electrified guitar, a Charlie Christian sound, in unison with trumpet. Okay, so it wasn't a, wasn't a strumming Never guitar. Never heard rhythm. I hate, it was a melody thing. I hate rhythm guitar. 
So his part never had rhythm at all, and he only played uh, as a, and you couldn't get any guitar players who could read. Nobody read single string. Wow. It was impossible. And uh, as I grew and as I did album after album, and every guitar player in the world used to call me, can I borrow the book? He did, they didn't know how to read single string. And not fast, you know, you're playing Mountain Greenery. And guitar players can't play that, and yeah. they learn. And Tony Rizzi was on the band, and then later on I had Tommy Tedesco, who could read because he was a fiddle player. Mm -hmm. So he could play all these things. and uh, It became a sound that was the only reason that the octet was interesting, is that why does the band sound so big? And it's because guitar wow. underneath trumpet and then the tenor and trombone and, and baritone all playing against it. It gave it togetherness like a bassy type thing mm -hmm. and then interesting like Marty Page would write, like a fugue or, or inter or shorty would write things like that. That were very, it was an arranger's band, believe me. The arrangers loved the band. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of arrangements. Uh, I still get requests every day for people to, the schools want to borrow the charts mm -hmm. because it teaches the kids how to write. There was something about it. So when I, I started John Williams in the, in the music business, uh, John was working for me. I was an A&R man at Topps Records, Buck 49 in the supermarkets. <laughs> and John wrote the first two albums he ever wrote were for me. 50 bucks a chart, and here's the great John Williams, wow. who is my favorite, and great, great, great jazz player, too. Um, he wrote some albums for me. He wrote a John Kirby album for me, which was incredibly written and beautiful things, and mm -hmm. Benny Carter played on it. And so I've had a lot of fun, but it, it, my group originally was a, a, an octet of arrangements by Bill Holman and Marty and, and Shorty and, you know, mm -hmm. Bob Florence. Uh, so that was interesting yeah. to me. Well, it's important to have, try to establish a sound is like like Shearing did. Yeah. You know, he had... Same thing, the, the block thing, hands right. playing with guitar underneath. Yeah. And it was all that kind of sound, and it was a very commercial sound. Because we could do albums of Rogers and Hart and Berlin and Jimmy Van Usen and all those things that you're doing now. We did them 45 years ago, which was, they said, oh, pal, you're so commercial. I said, yeah, but I'm home every night. I'm not on the road. I work every weekend. I work college dates. We do a jazz concert, but we also do a dance. Mm -hmm. We behave. You know, when Jack Sheldon came on the band, and I'm trying to behave, and he's such an unbridled character, and I'm saying, Jack, please, Melody. And he <laughs> said, oh, what is this? I want to play jazz. What is <laughs> No, Jack, we're playing a prom. Everybody's dressed out yeah. there. They're going to remember this all their lives, and here you are. <laughs> and uh, he got up one time and started playing a solo. He said, Key of F, you know, everybody plays medleys. Uh, Med Flory would get up and sing. Ray Sims would play and sing. And, and Jack calls out a tune, uh, three flats. And the piano player modulates into three flats. And Jack sits there and plays. Bop, 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 bop. And he does a whole chorus of just bop, bop. And... Uh, Afterwards, we said, oh, what, what tune was that, Jack? He says, jumping at the woodside, third trumpet part. <laughs> and we, we died, you know that. And here you are in a lovely prom, and everybody's so dressed up and everything. And here's the great jazz player playing bop, bop. <laughs> you know, can you, uh, since we're on camera, can you explain this? That's three to, flats. To our students. That's, and, and that's in why three it's... flats because down is flats. Uh -huh. And if you're going to play in four sharps, like Lester, yeah. or seven sharps, like <laughs> Lester, uh, he always, you know, did that kind of number. So he, you'd yeah. signal all the sharps as this, flats as right. that. Okay. And uh, the story about Lester, which, or Ray, uh, Ray Brown, we're doing a show one day, and... They're playing the blues, you know, uh, uh, we're, we're not even paying attention. And they're playing the blues. Uh, for uh, While the cameras are being set up, the bands always used to do fills, you know, yeah. and things like that. And Ray Brown is playing the blues, and they're cooking, boy. 
and say, okay, Dave, let's go. And I get up and play, and I realize all of a sudden they're playing an E, oh. which puts you in F sharp on your horn. And I said, holy mackerel, what did you do? And I fumfered and fumfered through a, a <laughs> couple of courses and sat down. And Ray Brown looks at me and says, I told you, you're a 12 handicap saxophone player. <laughs> Because we play golf yeah. together all the yeah. time. And he said, but see, Lester did that. Lester Young. He used to, every, if everybody was playing Lady Be Good in uh, F or G, he would play, let's play it in G. And then all, all the horn players had to play in A. Mm -hmm. Because we're, uh, and that's yeah. very tough to play on, on certain horns. Or an E, uh, which is great for guitar. But terrible for the horns to play in. Right. And Lester did that on purpose. Half the time he played Lady Be Good, no, no, let's play it up a tone. And oh, no kidding. everybody else around him died. They're, you know? they're falling out and he's like <laughs> sailing, he's right? Well, because he doesn't, he doesn't think sharps and flats. He hears it and plays it. He doesn't care. He didn't care, you know. But it was very interesting. A lot of guys did that out of meanness, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> The or, cutting well, contest. I one guess. other thing that Lester did is kind of thinking about it. Lester would do, if you're going to play a, a thing where you play one chorus and, you know, uh, Chewberry was on Basie's band. And Chewberry is playing a chorus on Lady Be Good. And it's delight. It is a delight. And Lester's sitting there getting pissed. And he's burning. And he's getting mad. And he starts thinking, well, I'll show these guys. So Lester used to come up with these things, which I'm going to play in the band today, mm -hmm. uh, uh, things where he would do things out of meter. Ba -da -dee -da -ba. And the band's cooking like this, you know? And he'd do da da dee da the left field kind of thing. And only he would know that he's where he's at. And all of a sudden, the rhythm section would look at each other and come back, oh, yeah, that, that's cool. But he would do it. Uh -huh to screw up everybody else around him and show him that he was going to be cuter than the next guy. He was funny. He was a funny man, you know. He, his dialogue was funny. He named everybody around him. Yeah. Uh, in retrospect, that's how he got the name Prez, is because he named Billy Holiday oh, yeah. Lady Day. Yeah. He called Sweets Sweets, you know. And, and Lester became Prez because she said he was the president of all mm -hmm. saxophone players. Mm -hmm. So it was kind of fun. Were you under his, his uh, influence as a coming up? Uh, I think I played like Coleman Hawkins when I was in my 13 and 14 and 15 year old body and soul, that kind of thing, and Ben Webster. And then all of a sudden, uh, this other sound came about mm -hmm. where Zoot and, and Stan and some of the guys were playing, and they were playing like Lester. And I started saying, oh, that's a delight. It was so melodic and so pretty. And I, I always had a very thin tone, a very minute tone compared to a big saxophone, like Frank West is playing today. Yeah. It's a big sound. And I had this pea shooter tone. And it fit what I was trying to do. And in my mind, I was thinking of Lester Young. And you start listening to Lester. And as you listen to Lester, and listened to all the solos he played. And I did see him in person a lot and met him and all that. Uh, it was amazing how great, but he was very careful in what he played. He didn't have the chops of all the guys that could play up tempos like it meant nothing. He, he would just play anything, but it was always melodic. It was always great. You know, I loved it. It was fun. In the presentation you're doing tonight this must have been a real labor of love to <laughs> put that together. Bill Holman. Yeah. And I went to Bill Holman and said, let's do super sax, but with Lester. Right. And let's do the three tenors and baritone sound of the four brothers. That way I could play lead and we could have that marvelous warm sound that Jimmy Jufri set up with four brothers. And... Uh, Lester was easy to do because normally he would start the first chorus down. He liked to build to something. So when playing the first chorus down, all the tenors and baritone all play unison. And as you get into the second chorus, all of a sudden he starts flowing and now you can harmonize. Uh -huh. And it was a delight to play. And half of the guys, 
we did the first album with Sweets, and Sweets started crying the first time he heard the tunes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Fun. It was Boy. fun. And then the, we did one album with Sweets, and then we did uh, Bill Holman, uh, and I decided that let's do uh, a vocal album, and we asked Joe Williams to, to join us. And Joe says, yes, love it, but don't change any of the keys. I want to do the things where less to play them. I, as a singer, have learned to sing in many facets. You don't mm -hmm. have to give me my key. Wherever it lays right for everybody else, I'll work it out. And so we played things, and they were a lot of bad keys for, for uh, Joe, but uh -huh. he, he, he was came such through. a pro. Yeah. And uh, but the, the the charts that uh, Bill Homan uh, made as backgrounds, with a Prez sound, felt like Prez had just played it. All the mm -hmm. solos were Prez and written out. Now, as we got to work with Joe a lot, Joe would never leave the stand when the saxophones were playing because he would sing in unison. <laughs> I mean, he knew every song like you can depend on me. You see Joe sitting; he just had finished singing, and now he's singing pop, ba ba do ba dee doo doo, <laughs> and it was fun. Wow. We'd go. Joe called me a couple of times. Uh, called me once. Uh, Come on to Chicago. We'll play golf every day, but we'll get a Chicago band. Just bring the book, and we'll play press conference. And the press conference was Bill Holman's name, by the way. He mm -hmm. he had a tune called Press Conference. He wrote for uh, Woody uh, a long time ago. But Joe just thought that, gee, isn't this fun? Having Lester Young solos all night long, <laughs> and I get to sing with the band. Yeah. And, and it's a nice sized band. Now it's too big for anything. Eight men mm -hmm. can't afford it. Yeah. You know, bring a trio in. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> it was a lot of fun at the time because. Uh, uh, Joe is a good musician, and when he scats, I never knew he could scat like he does. I mean, we did How High the Moon, he sang, but you know, he would sing that part, but he also, you know, uh, had his own thing that he went with, and he was great. Just a marvelous singer, marvelous guy. We play golf all the time. Uh -huh. Yeah, I mean, my best friend is Lester Young's brother, Lee Young, a drummer. Used to be with jazz at the Philharmonic. Mm -hmm. And we play golf every Friday, and Lee tells a funny story. Um, here he's, he was a conductor for Nat Cole in the last 10 years of his life. And uh, Lee is a marvelous cat, a marvelous guy, but a great golfer. And he used to beat me up every time on the golf course. And Lee already, you know. <laughs> he was doing an interview once, somebody's telling stories about the, the Nat Cole trio mm -hmm. and uh, playing with uh, Le uh, Lester, uh, with Lee Young. And Lee says, uh, well, I'm kind of retired. I do have some income. And the guy said, oh, well, you want to talk about it? He says, yeah, I send a limo every week and we pick up Dave Pell and bring him to the golf course. And <laughs> I, I beat him for... 50, 75 bucks every week, and I live off of it, so it's kind of nice. So, uh, but I can't report it, but that's how I make my living now. Oh, man. <laughs> and it, it's a lot of fun. We play, uh, Ray Brown and I play against Lee Young. The two of us mm -hmm. stand our two balls against Lee Young, and he still kills us. And the man's 83 now. Last week he had a 78 and an 81. Wow. That ain't shabby. So many musicians play golf, I've noticed. Well, it's, it's a good place to be in Shangri-La, yeah. in the middle of the world. Uh, uh, in the 50s, I was a six handicap, and I played golf every day of the summer trip. we drive 500 miles after the gig at night, get to a town at 6 o'clock in the morning, go on the golf course, play 18 holes, go back to the room, gets a nap and then go and work the gig. But we could make the road trips a dream. I knew the whole country by golf courses. <laughs> you know, some guys know the steakhouses. I yeah, knew the yeah. golf courses. Uh, you know, I had a couple of guys on the right. band that played. Uh, it was nice. a great way to make a, a, a terrible existence. It was never terrible. It was always fun. But a great existence on the road with a band, with all the booze and all the whatever yeah. was going on. You made it livable by being on the golf course mm -hmm. or playing tennis. So mm -hmm. some of us really try to take care of ourselves, and That's it was great. fun. Yeah. Do you remember uh, 
when Joe first started with the Basie band. Oh, and, yeah. And that record came out and that whole thing. Well, he had excitement that Witherspoon maybe didn't have or, you know, the guys that were singing with uh, Basie, that he had something that was different. He was a good-looking cat, but he, he swung pretty good. And, you know, I don't know if he ever played a horn. I don't know if he... Uh, played piano or I nothing, heard. but he it was a good musician. He never got lost. He never was in need for a bell note or a, to come in in the right key. He would, boom, point him to the microphone, to the camera, and say, okay. And he sang. And mm -hmm. Never liked to rehearse. He'd do a session, press conference. I did an album with him, and one of the saxophone players squeaked on one of his solos. And... Joe says, great, man, it felt great. I said, oh, come on, let's do another take. Guy doesn't want a thing out with a squeak on it. Joe says, sure. We did another take, and of course we used the one with a squeak because it never sounded good again. <laughs> he didn't want to do it. He felt that the feeling is more important than anything. I yeah. mean, just to get a feeling on a, a tune, uh -huh. that is marvelous. And that's what he had with Basie. He had a feel. He had yeah. a a great kind of thing, and he's a pretty good golfer, too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll tell you he is, too. Oh, he's a bitch. <laughs> hey, just great. He's right down, strong player, and, you know, and as we get older, we have seven woods and things. Golfers will know what I'm talking about. Instead of hitting a five iron or a four iron, we go to an easier or an old man's club. Uh -huh. But he could really work it. He was uh -huh. a good, great player. <laughs> oh, that's fascinating. He lived on the golf course <laughs> yeah. in Vegas. So uh -huh. he's, he was always, you come to his home, where's Joe? Oh, he's out in the back chipping. <laughs> He'd be out there playing. <laughs> Musicians like to practice. Mm -hmm. That's why we play good golf. You get as much out of golf as you put in it. And musicians, you can't make friends with the horn just because you played well at one point in your yeah. life. You know, it looks back at you and says, uh-uh, you ain't going to pick me up once a month and think I'm going to play for you. You better put some more time in, in playing. Like yesterday, I played baritone on Frank Capp's band. For we the heard. first time in 45 years, I played baritone. Is I, that right? I never play baritone. I oh. hate baritone. It's terrible. <laughs> and <coughs> the only thing bad about playing a horn that's in a different key is that you're picturing and you're playing a note and you're not hearing that note. Mm -hmm. A different note is coming out because you're so used to playing tenor where you play or I play by whatever comes to your mind it just comes naturally. Now I'm hearing a fifth <laughs> below or above and I'm going crazy. I'm saying oh yes I'm playing baritone I gotta remember that. Uh -huh. And I was telling my lady, I said, you know what, I'm dying. And she says, what do you mean? I said, my pinky's hurt. <laughs> what do you mean your pinky's hurt? I said, my hands are killing me. These pinkies are killing me. Why? Well, I'm baritone, you're always playing the bottom. Right. The you're low right. B and the low B flat and the low C. And I, they gave me a, a terrible horn to play. I was going to bring mine from California, but no, they gave me a horn to play. It was a Bundy, the worst horn I ever played in my life. <laughs> Terrible horn. And he gives me this horn to play, and no bottom. There was no, I, you had a really squeeze. So every time I wanted to play the bottom, my pinkies were killing me. <laughs> <laughs> How did you do last night, Dave? Well, I'm fine, yeah. except I can't move my pinkies. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a unique occupational hazard, I guess. <laughs> Great. I know. You can get workman's comp for that or not, sure, but I think so. <laughs> Bad horn. Well, you know. I had one more question about the, the the Prez thing, and I, from an arranger standpoint, he must have done certain things on his solos that kind of went out from oh, the chord yeah. structure, sure. and from a from a harmonizing standpoint, it must be quite a challenge to put but something were never underneath out that. of the chord structure. They were they were cutely. Uh, rounded around it, he'd always come back into mm -hmm. something. Lester was a comedic saxophone player. He was funny. When he played, now you write that out in music. When Bill Holman had to say, 
I want you to play na 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 na. How do you write that? Yeah. So yeah. it was kind of cute, and every time Bill, being a saxophone player himself, he'd say, "Don't use your D this way. Play side D here. Oh, yeah. Don't play E flat with your regular way. Play side E flat because I want that sound." And then a lot of times, I said, "We'd go ba ba da ba da ba." And one was side and one was closed to give him a difference. He was a funny character. A lot of times I, I, on my part would be a thing called CB. I said, okay, Bill, what's a CB? He says, I want you to do a Charlie Barnett. You know when you play B flat mm -hmm. and you get that thing where the note goes up and down mm -hmm. in your throat? Well, that's a CB. On B flat only, he wanted that sound. <laughs> so, and then wow. a couple of times, Bill would say after a long phrase, he he put a notation on my part. He says, "Okay, now faint." <laughs> you know. So, all this is fun. You know, when you do music that uh, Bill Holman or Bob Florence do that are fun, or Shorty, or any of those guys, they were all characters because they wrote things. And then Lester, doing Lester, after listening for so long of all the things he played and then singing and writing. Oh, it was so different. It was mm. such fun. He, marvelous, marvelous uh, personality. And as he got sicker and closer to his uh, passing, um, he still had the, uh, the values of swinging and very, he was like an arranger playing saxophone. Mm -hmm. We have uh, Sometimes I'm Happy. The last eight bars of Sometimes I'm Happy is a dream to play. It's like an arrangement. Somebody putting a button or an ending on a, a song. And that's what Lester did. He mm -hmm. wrote arrangements. He'd start here, end here, do, you know, never showed off, but was always an arranger. And it was great. Yeah. It was great. And, uh, I've never enjoyed anything as much. I think the guys playing Charlie Parker got mad at him after a while because he he just played so marvelous, but so hard. So hard. And Lester didn't do that. Although, it's funny, one of the guys here in town, Kenny Soderblom, who played with a lot of bands and everything, he says, there's one bar in Symphony Sid I haven't figured out yet. <laughs> I said, well, I don't think anybody figured it out because Lester just plays it. If you read the notes, you can't do it. Uh -huh. You can't play it. He says, but we got harmony. You got the easy part. You can yeah. play the melody and you can just do something. I said, no, no, no. You just have to, to flow with Lester. Mm -hmm. Lester was a guy that I'm going to make you laugh. I'm going to make you smile. And that's what he did every time he played. You know, he did things that were funny. I bet he's looking down on this whole thing oh, and he loved he's loving it. it. He <laughs> loves it. He, he was a character. He was funny, and I tell stories, and Lee Young tells me stories. Every week he's got another Lester story. Mm -hmm. He wants to say, well, you know, Lester, when we were in Kansas City, we did that, and when we had our own band, we did this, and oh, I'm, I'm on the floor, because <laughs> I, I love the guy as a friend, but he also tells all these stories that are great. Joe tell, if you can get Joe up, mm -hmm. he's a great storyteller. He, yeah. He's funny. Wow, that's great <laughs> stuff. How'd you get into photography? Um, I was a very bad amateur, mm -hmm. but I was available on the Bob Hope show when I was on Les Brown's band. I always had my camera here, so when they'd come over to rehearse in front of the band, I'd have four bars out and I'd take some shots and everything, and then I brought them by all the time and we're giving Bob Hope and Bing Crosby and, and Jerry Colonna and all these people, all these copies of the stuff I was doing that nobody else was getting because I was in this position. So uh, uh, we go to Korea and there's no room on the plane for the NBC photographer. So NBC says, you cover it for us and we'll pay for your film and your fur. Mm -hmm. I said, okay. And then Chesterfield, who was the cigarette sponsor, they came to me and says, well, there's nobody on the plane. Can we have half the rights to the shots that you use that you're shooting for NBC? I said, I'm a professional. Uh -huh. 
<laughs> kidding. You know, from, uh, from sitting on the bed. And everything I shot was great because I'd shoot from the aircraft carrier into the, the guys because I was back here. Mm -hmm. and, and I go on trips with uh, Bob Hope that nobody else went with because we go play the hospitals. And we play uh, in Korea. We go, uh, a guitar player, bass player, and myself go on all the wards with him so he could sing. And while he's talking, we'd be in the other wards playing. So there was always, and you couldn't take a piano around, so guitar, bass, and me would go and play. And I did all this in photography. I came back with stuff that was just exquisite, you know. Mm. And so I'm, I became a professional. And then I started doing album covers. I've done 400 album covers. And, uh, but that's all luck. You get on a session, and while they're rehearsing, you do all the shots, and then mm -hmm. when they're shooting the, the thing, uh, or doing a take, you, you back off or you go in the other room and get out of the way. But nobody resented having me there because I knew when to, to shoot and everything. Right. And everything was existing light. Uh, the first uh, Jerry Mulligan cover with the four guys looking up. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's mine. So I've been involved in a lot of album covers, a lot of photography, and I, you know, I still shoot a lot. I'm shooting uh, this weekend uh, for Ken Poston, the producer, because he wants all, not the shots that everybody else is going to get. Right. He wants the shots of the rehearsals and, and stuff like that. And uh, I like the camera. It's a good creative... Uh, it's like playing uh, How High the Moon in a, a different key, yeah. Yeah. just trying to find out if it'd be interesting. Uh -huh. And photography, it, it kind of is creative, it's fun. Uh, I'm down to cameras now because I can't see uh, uh, that focus automatically, which is nice. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a crutch, but um, I still shoot a lot. I, I always have the camera with me. I have Great. thousands of pictures. Uh, a guy in Spain that owns Fresh Sound Records is going to put out a, a photography book on me. All right, excellent. So uh, it's it's been a lot of fun. So I had a photography business. I have a studio. I make uh, CD masters. Uh, uh, I'm kind of telling you that there's not much playing activity in jazz, and you really can't make a living in jazz, but you sure can use and improvise the things around it. So I do a lot of uh, jazz companies. I do a lot of producing. I've produced hundreds of albums. Um, I was the head of, uh, uh, I was fired from 11 record companies. Now that's, in the record business, this is very good. Because when you're fired from a record company, it's that you've been changed with the whole personnel of the head of the company who was also fired, and then all his people go with him. Uh -huh. So I've had my own record company, and I've had uh, uh, a lot of fun in the record business. Uh, I found a girl named Vicki Carr and produced 11 of her albums, and I've had a lot of hit records. I was the first head of Motown on the West Coast. Uh, I signed Lionel Richie, was that his name? Yes. Yeah. And I had a lot of fun. Uh, you know, I, I did a lot of things. Uh, uh, produced, uh, now I have a little studio in my home, and I take old masters and make them sound like they were done you know, right. today. I have two or three hundred uh, Kenton things from the guys in the band. The Kenton band used to have one they were just starting at the Rainbow Ballroom, they had a little web core tape machine recording as they were getting the feed into monitor. Mm -hmm. Remember the NBC show Monitor? It was yeah. a, a great show they used to record a lot of bands mm -hmm. uh, broadcast. And I have all those masters and uh, uh, I've been kind of in that f record industry ty type thing for a long time. Produced a lot of jazz albums. Uh, I like producing. I like playing. Playing is fun. Playing is, I, I'm, I'm doing more playing now because I'm enjoying it more. Right. Uh, I find that, oh yeah, this is fun. This, I don't have to charge for this. I can just go out and <laughs> sit in, in the band. And yeah. I walked in the other night because we were coming here and I wanted to play a little. And I walked into a club where I'd been going to see this gal sing and there was a good piano and bass player. And I walked in sheepishly with my horn. I said, don't say a word. I'll just stand behind the piano. I'll just... And she says, you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs>
and she loved it. You know, it was one yeah. of those things. We had a great time, and I played all night. Uh -huh. and had them, but just stood behind the band. Right. And again, the, the marvelous thing that happens is that you find out, well, boy, what a nice way to make a living. Uh-huh. Oh, okay. Jazz is great. It's, it's introduced me to a, a world of things that I would have never had. Mm -hmm. And I play with all the bands. I play with Benny Goodman, I play with Harry James, you know. And uh, that was a great era. And then when I started my band, I got in more into jazz and enjoyed that. But I also got into more studios because I was home. I was in L.A. And the oboe and English horn got us to play on West Side Story and got us to play on um, hundreds of movies. Uh, I did a lot of things for Mancini. Uh, uh, when he was writing, he was at Universal. He was just a $300 a week arranger, a conductor mm -hmm. at, at Universal. And look what, look where he is. Oh no, that's wrong. Boy, yeah. <laughs> but uh, those are the kind of things you grow up in. And then as you, it, it kind of slows down in that area. Then you go back into playing, because people keep on saying to me, can we go borrow your charts, you uh -huh. know? And you know, I get invited to Vegas or something. They say, we have a band here called the Dave Pell Octet. Would you mind playing with us? You know, <laughs> you know would you come That's up great. or listen to us and then sit in with us? And um, being a, a, a book of three or 400 songs of all these great arrangers, I've had more fun with schools mm -hmm. because uh, they all want to play. What do you mean? these These... 40 years later, sound good. What uh -huh. is that? You know, like Basie, it sounds the same. Sounds good. You can't explain it. Why? You know. And so yeah. I've had a good time. It's been a sound marvelous career, <laughs> my goodness. And in the immediate future is another golf game with well, Mr. Cole. Well, I'm manufacturing <laughs> golf clubs. You're doing that too? I manufacture golf clubs. I found out that I hit the ball and I missed a shot. It can't be me. It's got to be the equipment. <laughs> of course. So I changed the driver and I changed the shaft and then I, I got to know how to do this, improvising again. Uh -huh. I look at your golf swing and I can tell you what kind of club you should have or you should be swinging. And I do, sorry about this, but I do the rip-offs of the, the clubs that are being sold. I do clubs that look like the Callaway uh -huh. and look like the Cobra. And yeah because uh, there's a whole thing about uh, this being available from uh, Taiwan. We buy the heads, and, and I put the heads with some different shafts, and, and now titanium is a big mm -hmm. thing. So I learned how to make golf clubs, and now I'm in the business of uh, golf, and uh, I'm manufacturing a putter called the Level I Putter, which is a little carpenter's level. And I've embedded it into a plastic putter, the head of the pla is all uh -huh. plastic, there's some metal in the club to give it some weight, and you look down at the putter at the, the level, yeah. and it tells you that you're holding your club correctly. Uh -huh. Now the USGA says, uh-uh, that ain't legitimate, you can't use this, it's an aid to the golfer that's illegal. So I have a putter that you can pull the level out. <laughs> Somebody complains that you're sinking too many putts and it's illegal. Oh, I'll take it out for when I hit the ball. <laughs> so I'm involved with that. All I'm manufacturing right. that and uh, again improvising and trying to figure out how to. So I have a very good golf business going, and that gives me the terrible excuse of going to a Thursday tournament because all the guys in the tournament are playing my club. Yeah, you can write it off as research. You know. Write it off, I get an order every week. <laughs> There's another new titanium bubble uh, shaft, and so I am having more fun, and I, I, it keeps my health good. Yeah. I, you know, I got tan, I don't have any wrinkles, I hate to tell you how old I am, but uh, yeah. I feel good, and young women, and uh, it, it's a lot of fun. It's been it's fascinating. <laughs> Man of many hats. Yeah. Oh, I loved it. Well. I, I think I would have been happier just playing. Mm -hmm. But I, I, it wasn't enough for me. Yeah. It wasn't enough of a challenge. I yeah. figured it's like sitting there in the band and watching the leader and, and realizing all the things he did wrong. It's saying, oh, I'm going to be the leader now. All right, I'm the leader. Now what? Well, I, I got 30 albums. Well, now what? Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, 
you keep on wanting to spread out. And it's like improvising. It's yeah. exactly like improvising. It's making something happen. You know, so it's fun. It's great. Well, on behalf of the college, <laughs> we would like to thank you for that really marvelous hour of, huh? of reminiscing. And great. I can't imagine what the next thing for you is going to be. <laughs> we'll do part two in a couple of years, and we'll, we'll see what else yeah, you're into. see where I've gone yeah. into from now. Great. Well, on behalf of Hamilton, I want to thank you for joining us today. It's been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed it. I hope I haven't talked too much. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you.